Welcome to Commander Central episode 46. Today we're going to be talking about Core 2019, or as Chris calls it, where the <laughs> f*** are my slivers? <laughs> <laughs> but before we get into where the slivers well, are... It didn't even dawn on me. There are no slivers <laughs> are in this none, set. None slivers. Take it up with Mero. Yeah. There's going to be many explosives that are coming out of my <laughs> mouth right now that you can't hear. There's already one there going to have to beep from me, so <laughs> it'll be, it'll be silent beeps from Chris. <laughs> Uh, before that, we'll talk about some games we played, some news, some contest information, and just some general stuff. I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris. How is everybody doing? We're back to normal order. Yeah, right. We're back, right. Although we're in different seating positions. I so, know. It's kind of weird. So hopefully I won't have to like move my head over the place while I'm talking since I'm a very animated talker, apparently. <laughs> you I'll are. A, I'll, have a, I'll have a very steady volume level on the mic this time. Um, any 4th of July plans for anybody? In-laws all day, like I do every year. Watch the pontoon parade. and Just for the day? Yep. How about you, Max? Alcohol. That's it, <laughs> alcohol, which is the same 4th of July plan as most people in this country. Yep. In Wisconsin, anyways. In Wisconsin, definitely. <laughs> I'm going up to Upper Michigan, because um, that's where my family's originally from, so it's like the Kentucky of the North, um, and I'll be up there for a couple days, um, so... Hopefully, I will survive that experience. It's always a little bit of touch and go up there. Knowing Dana, he's going to come home with like three guy cradles, a couple of dual lands. <laughs> I will. Some collection I do finds. that, though. Like when I go up there, I do check the small town stuff that I'm passing through to see if there's any collections for sale. So maybe I will find Wasn't one. Wasn't the last time that you went there, a lady was selling magic cards? Yes. And you went and bought them, and they the, were actually like magic they were, cards. They were like magic <laughs> trick cards. Yeah. Illusions. And I, and I felt so bad, I gave her the $10 for them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I got played. Um, any fun games from anybody this week? Max is at the shop. I would <laughs> like to start. So Max is at the shop for two games. How'd played, that go, Max? I played two games this week, both with Gahiji version two. And how and how did that go? The deck performed very well. Well, good. Did something else not go according to plan? Um, I should have won at least the first game, and quite possibly the second, but instead I ended up tilting due to uh, my opponents. <laughs> <laughs> dirtling or lack of knowledge of how to play the game and you got a little salty and you did uh, and i <laughs> i removed myself from the store you did you handled yourself well you're like i could see you were getting i was pissed so in the first pod when you lost it and you're like i'm gonna go play over there i'm like that's fine well i'm like nope go ahead max i'll stay here and we yep. can we'll get another pod going don't worry about and it how'd that go <laughs> um it was fine but it was still a little slow but it was fine um, but then I could hear you in the next fight. I'm like, "Ooh, he's not doing great tonight. I, it's a rough, it's a rough yeah. attitude evening." I went into that po- that second pod, still salty, and played super aggressively. And then just it went downhill. Packed up my cards, talked to a couple other people in the shop, and then went home for the night. Because I asked Chris like eight o'clock, I'm like, "Did Max take off?" And Chris was like, "Yeah, he just left." <laughs> and then like ten minutes later, you texted me. Yeah. Like, yeah, I had to leave. I was getting tilted. Yeah. My my observation was, if I stay, Phil's going to remove me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it would take a lot for Phil to remove you. Yeah, I was reaching that point. He was, get, he, was getting, he was getting there. So, I will be honest, I am not proud of how I acted this week at the shop. You weren't that bad. You got no, mad for like 10 seconds. But I've seen far, far well, worse. It was not that bad. So have I, but as magic content creators, we sure. should not. <laughs> we should try to do our best not to have that happen. You should That's just true. go outside and destroy a plastic water bottle like I did for the last tournament that I was in. You didn't shoot your deck like last <laughs> time? Mm. Oh, that was close. <laughs> I think you talked me out of that. I did. You know, yeah. those $120 lightning bolts. <laughs> that would have been a sad day. If I couldn't have talked you out of it, I would have just been like, I'll buy the deck for 40 bucks. And then <laughs> I would have been like, sure, it's just, gone. just don't shoot it. <laughs> How about you, Chris? You play any games? You played at least one. Cause you I played one deck. game for like four hours, I swear. I couldn't believe I kept walking over there. I'm like, is this the same game? No one's moved. You're in the same seats. People are so slow when they play. It, it just yes. it drives me <laughs> up a wall. And five-player games are also brutal. Well, I was playing with, they're all younger guys. Yeah. And there was one of them um, who actually was playing as fast as I was. Literally, I'd take my turn, I'm done. He'd take his turn, he's done. And then we'd sit and wait for like a half an hour for the next three sure. people to take their turns. It's like the Commander Championship Tournament. Right, yeah, <laughs> kind of, yeah, kind of. Uh, and you used my recce deck. Yep. And you got land flooded, you said. Oh, hard. It was like every card I would draw was a land, and I'm just like, oh, stop. I, I told you to cut that land, Dana. We've had this discussion. There's one card. I, well, I'm down to 35, so I don't want to cut it any lower. Well, the upside to getting all these lands, 
I was able to play the new Maltani. Okay. So he was huge. Yeah, well, <laughs> that yeah, was yeah, like yeah, the yeah. upside to it. The downside was that was all I could find. I've I've got him in that deck, and I've got him in my Mina and Den deck, and I've never been disappointed in having Maltani out. No, the cool thing is, is it counts the, car, the lands in your graveyard too. So like, right. I drew a strip mine at one point, and I'm like, oh well, that doesn't set me back any strip mine right, that. Exactly. <laughs> Maltani's still ginormous. Yep. I always forget that clause on that card is graveyard too. It can also return from the graveyard. It can. Right, you can also bring him back if you need to. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, the one thing I'm going to change in that deck, um, I don't want to cut lands because it's at 35 and the curve isn't super low. Um, so I, like, I need to have so many lands in the opening hand and I need to keep drawing them, so I don't want to cut much below that. But there's a card I found, Nostalgic Dreams. I think it's out of Odyssey. And it's green, green. And it says, as an additional cost to cast this spell, discard X cards. And you may return X cards from your graveyard to your hand. And then exile nostalgic, nostalgic dreams. So basically, in theory, then I can like when I have one of those hands with like six lands in it, it gives me the opportunity to pitch them and bring back anything I want to bring back. And then if Maltani's out, well, the lands are still buffing Maltani because they're in their graveyard. True. Um, but so I, I've got a regrowth in the deck right now, and I think I'm going to swap this for a regrowth because it's still the same CMC essentially. It's going to be two green versus one in a green. Regrowth gets me one, but in this case, I'm almost, I almost always have extra lands in my hand in that deck because it draws so many cards. So it'll give me something to at least use those extra lands in hand for. Because sometimes you don't hit Azusa. Because, you know, if I hit Azusa, it's easy to get them all into play. But if you don't, then you're just, if you're drawing eight cards a turn and two of them are three of them are lands. I hit Azusa. She lasted one turn. So <laughs> I got to play like three lands and sure, that was and everyone's it. Like, and I don't want to be with that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, I had a game. It was actually wasn't this week. It was the previous week. But I, I did want to mention it because um, like all, it was a game where like all the pieces for perfectly fell into play. Um, playing against a Dragonlord Ojitai deck, and he cast Approach of the Second Sun. And then what is up with everyone playing that card? I've seen. I've been seeing it quite a bit. Yeah, it's, it's popular in our shop. And you don't need, for the most part, you don't need extra things to win with it. Like if you're going to win with Helix Pinnacle or something, you probably need to plan and other cards to work with Helix Pinnacle. Or if you're going to win with, you know, Dark Steel, um, it's not Forge, it's Reactor. You need to put those counters probably. Whereas if you had Approach. You probably already have draw spells in your deck anyway. It's not that tough to get down to it. So that's anyway, that's my guess. Okay. But he cast approach and then swung with Ojitai, which let him like dig down it's a brainstorm essentially, right? Off Ojitai. It's an anticipate. Anticipate. And then and then he cast like an anticipate or something. So he got down to within a card or two of um the, the, the second cast of approach. Yep. And then he cast an extra turn spell. Temporal manipulation, I think it was. Um so he should take his extra turn and cast approach. I luckily had Vidalcan Ori in play, which shout out Joshua Kwai in every single deck. You should have. No, I, I don't think you should. But it's a really good card. It's, it is a good card. In the right deck, it's it's solid. So I had Vidalcan Ori in play, and I had all my lands on tap because I was saving my mana to do things at the end of turn. And I I knew I could deal with it, but I didn't quite know the sequence. So like I had to do like a timeout before you take your second turn. And I have a response, but I, I don't know how to do it yet. So in my head, I'm like quick trying to like whiteboard out, okay, if I do this, I do this, I do this. So it took me a minute to figure out, but what the sequence wound up being, I had a um, Mimic Vat that I put someone's Trinket Mage under. So I fired off Mimic Vat to make the Trinket Mage copy and went and got Engineered Explosives from my library to hand. So I cast Engineered Explosive for zero. And I then I uh, cast a Skullwinder, unless you bring another card back, to get a Vamp Tutor. I cast Vamp Tutor to put to to go get the Glamour and put it on top of my library. I popped Engineered Explosives for zero to kill like the two or three tokens in play. With Gliss's ability, I can bring artifacts back from the graveyard to my hand. Yep. So I went and got Horizon Spell Bomb, which lets you like tutor up a land. But if you spell, actually it wasn't it was a nil little spell bomb, which lets you exile a graveyard. And you can either one you can <laughs> to pay the black to draw the card. Yep. To draw the Glamour to hit his Soul Ring. To force him to shuffle, shuffle down to hide that approach. So then he took his extra turn, and then he then he was just trying to like furiously draw down to it. Suck it! And and I didn't win the game, but he didn't either. <laughs> and that is why I, matters. Right, I spent all my resources doing that, but he didn't get the the second approach off. So I was I was happy with that play, but it took me like three minutes of going. You need to just wait because there's a thing here, and I don't know what it is yet. 
So I got through to it. I got it done. It's one of those games where you look at all everyone else in the pod, and you're just like, I got this, homies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I did win a recce game at One Life this week. Um, I got hit with my own. What's the twelve twelve dining green Galta. dinosaur? Galta. I got hit with my own Galta. With someone reanimated, and I blocked it with like a something that was a three three or four three. So I only took nine damage, and I was at ten. Took me took me to one, and it was a pass turn, and then I just made all the mana in the world because I had I played Vorn Collects, and I already had Vernal Bloom out, so I was tapping for like oh. three a pop. Then I played Mana Reflection, so that was doubling all the mana sources, and then between Nykthos and I had um, uh, Marwyn the Nurturer out. So because I, I was playing so many creature spells, I also had the the Monument where each creature gets plus two plus two. So I got Vorn Collects up to like thirty, which means when I cast Overwhelming Stampede. Everything got 30-30. And then Marwyn could tap for like 60 mana. But I needed it because one person had Elephant Grass in play and one person had Spear of Safety in play. Oh, no. So then I had to spend, in order to kill people, I had to spend like the 90 mana I made between <laughs> Silvala and Marwyn to just run through people. But I got it done. Oh, lordy. I got to flash in Galta with Reki to block something. That feels good. Oh, no, not for my opponent. Like, yeah, right. Yeah, I attack, right. I'm all tapped out, and I'm like... I tap Recky and he's like, "How are you creating mana?" I'm like, "Oh, with this little like snake shaman dude." That's that's not shaman is really good. Yeah, and I'm like flashing Galta, and he's like, yep. "Oh no!" Because <laughs> <laughs> like you're never gonna, you're probably not attacking with Recky very often. You're probably not gonna be blocking with him, tapping him for two mana. That's fantastic, right? So I like that card. Um, yeah, I, I've I've that's my favorite deck to play right now. Probably, I am actually in the process of building Joyra Historic. We're just gonna call it historic. Okay. It's gonna be mainly artifacts, but there'll be a few planeswalkers. Like the egg, the eggs version, or just just a, like kind of a generic artifact. It's, I want to do it the same version how you have with Reki, where with every you cast something, you draw a card. So you're just like loop. You're just yep. Like just keep going giant more. Storm hands. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That'll be fun. I want to see that because I like that Jordan card a lot. But I don't think I've seen I've seen one Jordan deck in the shop, and it was pretty dirtily. I don't think he got anything done. But I know it can be a strong commander. Yeah, it's gonna be. I mean. It's not going to be based strictly on her, but I plan on doing mainly an artifact theme. Well, that's kind of a good segue into a thing I'm going to touch on here briefly. I've got some ridiculous notes written down, but I don't need to read this whole thing. Um, I played my Wasatora deck a couple more times. We talked about it in last week's show because I took it to Vegas fresh out of the box and, and played it, and it did fairly well, so I was excited to tweak it. So I did all my tweaks for it and played it a couple games this week, and nothing changed. Really? And I figured out why that is after having made the changes and, and, and then thinking about it. The the deck doesn't guarantee it, it's going to do its thing. So the, the plan is I'm running a bunch of creatures with like attack triggers or combat triggers and then a bunch of ways to do extra combat steps. So then the theory is whether it's Wasatora or Caustic Wasp or whatever I have for a creature in play, I can get double attack triggers as well as the damage you're doing. And I, I assume that would all kind of stack up. The problem is I don't have a way to guarantee I draw those extra attack steps without running like 10 or 15 tutors or something like that because there's only, you know, like half a dozen extra combat step cards. That are good. That are good. Like they're not like a gazillion mana. So to get the, if I get one of them, the deck works. Like I can kill people. And I, I, I one shot somebody with, I think, um, what's the one that has the kicker on it where you can, or entwine, where you get your creature double strike and. As well as an extra combat stuff. Anyway, it doesn't really... I, I know what you're talking yeah. about. So I killed somebody with that because Wasatora getting double strike and double damage and she had a counter on her. I just one shot somebody. So like it does those kind of things on occasion. But if I don't get those, I'm just running a bunch of creatures that can maybe get a combat trigger off and do a thing. So is this turning into your um, Angel, Archangel Avacyn or whatever deck I think again? so. Is that how it's feeling the to same, you? The same lack of consistency, yep. which might not be a problem for some people, but for me... I like to know I can do the thing my deck is going to do. So, because like with my Talrand deck, I just know by having Talrand there making me drakes and doing things that when I draw a cantrip into a cantrip into a cantrip, it's going to get that chain going. Or in Recce, playing your legendary creature to draw a card, which is probably a legendary creature to draw a card. Like, I like getting that kind of rock rolling downhill going on where like once it starts, everything falls into place. And I can't get this deck to do that. So I just don't know if it's going to be salvageable for me personally the way I want to play. Okay. So the quest, so the, the question, and the, I don't need an answer from anybody, but this is to you too as well as anyone listening to think about, is there a thing that you guys do in your deck building 
and I'm not talking about like I like tokens or I like draw, just like maybe higher level than that where I'm saying I, I like to have my deck do this feedback loop like that that I can always hit. Is there a thing like that for you guys that you really want in your deck and if you find it you can't do it, it's not that fun to play? So anyway, you don't need an answer right now. Think about it for the week or two weeks. We'll talk about it down the road. And if anyone listening on, on the Twitter birds wants to respond to us, let us know as well. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just curious. So I have a question to put out to you two. Yeah. And this just popped in my head as we were talking about this. I was playing a multiplayer game on Saturday, I do believe it was, before the store championship. And a guy I was playing against was playing Mono Blue, Baby Jace is his general. And he had kept trying to show and tell Omniscience into play. Like that was his, his win condition? Well, th- that's what he had going on at that time. Okay. He did it like three times, and finally we let it resolve. And the guy next to me played Ulamog, the infinite guy or whatever. Yep. And said, I'm going to destroy your Omniscience. <laughs> now, we all know you can't do that because it's a cast trigger. Right. Now, am I a bad player because I did not want Omniscience to stay on the field <laughs> that I just ignored it? Are you talking the original Ulamog? Or yes. the new Ulamog? Original Ulamog. Yeah. Because they're all cast triggers. So he, so, so the, 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 the Jace player didn't realize this. No, no one realized it. I looked around, and I'm just like, sure, yep, destroy it. <laughs> Man. Um, Does that huh. make me a bad person? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about It depends. Man, yes. Like, like the, like, according to the good place, <laughs> the ethical answer here is that, like, yes, you should always follow the rules, and I understand that. You did what's best for the table. <laughs> I mean, well, kind of. We right. didn't, like, I, I, I didn't get also... to finish the game neither because we ended up starting a store championship. We all scooped up and played, but it was. And then later, the guy sent out a big Facebook message to all of us. He's like, "That's not how Ulamog works." He's like, "I didn't even catch that." And I'm like, mm, "No oh, comment." Yeah. yeah, that's that's crazy. I don't know this what happened. This isn't competitive there. REL. Right. Um, yeah, man, I would have been super tempted, particularly against like a baby Jace. It was probably a pretty heavy control deck, a lot of counter spell kind of deal. No, he wasn't doing any no. of that. He just kept trying to play Omniscience, <laughs> no, and we were no, worried no. what was going to happen after that. Sure, um, I, I, I might have been pretty tempted to feign ignorance on that ruling. How about you, Max? I would have been on my phone and totally missed what was going on. <laughs> sure, <so>. right. <laughs> 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 well, we'll take some feedback on that. What do you guys think about uh, when you see something egregious happen? <laughs> you're just like, eh, I could say something, but... <laughs> well, especially when it's like there's five of us playing and no one caught it. So. Right, right. Um, yeah, so anyone listening, you know, uh, you can reach out to us on Twitter at CMDR Central, Facebook search us CMDR Central, find us on YouTube CMDR Central, or online at CMDRCentral.com. And if anyone has any opinion on my horribleness of that, <laughs> <I> <laughs> let believe, me know. I believe the term is dirtbag. Right, yeah. <laughs> yes. Chris is going to be moving over to the CCO podcast to be playing with Ryan and backstabbing people from this point on. Ooh. <laughs> He explained what happened on this week's show. It was he did. Intense. Did he? Yeah, it's good. It's worth listening to, to hear the, the whole thing. Uh, I'm going to have to pull it up when I get home. Because yeah. I only caught the end when I'm like, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> you can also find us on Patreon by searching CMDR Central, along with FlipsideGaming.com. Uh, so head over there. Use the promo code CMDR on your checkout. Get 10% off your entire order including those cool Richard Kane Ferguson playmats that they are advertising right now. I placed a Flipside Gaming order tonight for cards for a deck I'm going to build using a commander from Core 2019 that we will touch on when we go through our review here in a little bit. Nice. Also, uh, speaking of Patreon, we should probably say we have our two new contests to announce for July. Yes, we do. So... We are very fortunate to have a friend named Mike Peterson from Lodestone Coffee and Games. He is graciously uh, donating his Judge Foil Pendlehaven and Judge Foil Merchant Scroll to us for giveaways this month. So thank you, Mike. Um, and, you know, thanks for being a listener and supporting us. So the Pendlehaven will be our Twitter giveaway for the month of July. Yep. Use hashtag CMDRJudge. CMDR judge to be entered in the contest to win a Judge Foil Pendlehaven. Yep. And then the Merchant Scroll will be our Patreon giveaway for the month of July. So as long as you become a Patreon or are still a Patreon by July 31st, you will be entered to win that card. I do got to say, I love all these hashtags. Like I float through Twitter <laughs> yeah. and I look at them and see how people, you know, like intriguingly place yep. it into what they're saying. And yep. it's just like, that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um. For those wondering, since this episode is airing on July 2nd, we are not quite ready to announce our June contest winners. 
due to the holiday, we are actually double recording tonight, like yep. we did a couple weeks ago for Vegas. So we will be announcing the June contest winners on the episode that airs on July 16th. This also is giving us a little time to get some M19 cards for our Attractable deck to sub in for some of the cards from our personal collection that we only have one of. Yes. So mid-July, we'll be, we'll be doing the announcement for the winners from June, and then the July contest will should be back on schedule by, by first week of August to do that announcement. So. Yep. And while we're talking about Patreon, we do have three new pledges to uh, give a shout out to. The first one being Jacob Anderson. Uh, the second being, why are you smirking? Because I just <laughs> it sounds you. like a fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> we got new pledges. <laughs> Haze them. <laughs> As first, part of your package, you'll be a paddling, <laughs> <laughs> and we let Ulamog destroy whatever we want. Right, no right, right. <laughs> uh, a uh, friend of the show, Luke Witten, he used to be the co-host with Dana and I of uh, the CMC. Yes. And then Cameron Jackson is our final new p- Patreon pledge from uh, the last couple weeks. Thank you all very much for helping keeping the lights on here in the Basement of Love. Yes, thank you. Mm, Wait, Basement of Love? How many <laughs> times are we going to change the name of this place? <laughs> we, we need to like just settle on one descriptor for the... the <laughs> no, I like how it changes you know, every time. Got, I t- actually, I kind of do too. We should put a whiteboard up on the wall so, so whoever know. gets here first, it can change the name. There we go. <laughs> That's a good idea. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of news, but like I'm not too worried about going... Because there, there the, the Silver Series was announced today, which is going to be at Pro Tour Minneapolis? Pro Tour... 25th anniversary which, which is, is, in which is in minneapolis the first weekend of august it's essentially a rochester draft of some really old magic sets i think there's an arabian knights pack a legends pack it's, no, is this nope. open to the public no no so okay. the silver showcase will be a rochester draft event like no other players will rochester draft three packs each of beta one pack of arabian knights one pack of antiquities and one pack of legends. That'll be pretty sweet to watch, though. Y- yes, but um, I think it's only it's it's invite only to like eight or ten people. I forget. I, th- I hope they stream it. I don't know if are they going to stream it for sure. I'm sure they will because they did the beta draft. They did the at beta Vegas. draft at Vegas. So I would guess it's it's going to be streams or something. Yep. Like um, I wasn't going to go over there for the pro tour, but I think I'm going to now. It's an hour and ish away. I'll go. That, that'll be fun to see, I think. It is an eight-player draft, and they have already selected the players. You can go to the Mothership and read the yeah. article. Um, it's gotten a lot of drama today on yes. the Twitter birds, but we're not going to get into that because no. we're and not I, pro I, players. I wanna, and I want to see it. Like, I'll watch it. I think it'll be fun to, fun to see. So I think it will. Yeah. I really wish we could have been there for the beta draft. Yes. In yeah, Vegas. I, I regret so. that. That's like the one thing I regret about missing is the beta draft. So I, I would I'm totally drop a thousand dollars to beta draft. You could have qualified. It was yeah. just it was just sealed dominaria drafts all weekend to get in. You had to f- win next, next year when they do the alpha draft, Chris, you can try to qualify. Oh, I'm gonna jump all over <laughs> that. And you're gonna be in a hazmat suit. Right, and exactly. Like a purified queen room so you don't kill disintegrate the card and i'm gonna open. make everyone faint when i pull the black lotion and be like yeah and then throw it across the room <laughs> it's, a, it's a rochester draft so everybody sees the packet yeah, open right oh and then so like you sit in your circle and they open the pack they spread all the cards out and if you have pick one you do pick one and it goes around the table yep, i'm gonna take that lotus and be like Woo! <laughs> and throw it over my shoulder and I, just see what happens i feel <laughs> as if you wouldn't <laughs> i feel as if you would keep that Challenge because accepted. <laughs> <laughs> you will because even damage be... that card's worth a lot of money. Because like I'm like a beta lotus. That's that's a, a good year of a college education, <laughs> like, right? That's, that's all right. That's, that's a down payment on a house. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> just gotta find someone to buy it. That's right. The thing. Exactly. You just turn around, walk over to a vendor, and be like, "How much?" Let's let's make a deal. <laughs> just be like, pick one. I drop. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> all right. Core 2019. So this is the first core set we've gotten since Origins, which was a pretty good core set. I was yep. happy with Origins. Origins was pretty good. Origins was nice. So let's start with the reprints quick because we can just like mention them and move on since our cards we already know exist. Then we want to kind of go over the list of notable ones we've got here. Like Chris what, was like just ta- shift? <laughs> Chris was just talking about one of these. Which one was I talking about? Ulamog's favorite target, Omniscience. Yeah, Omniscience. And Crucible Worlds is in there. Uh, Scape Shift, you mentioned. Death Baron. Yep. Which needed it. That was like over 20 bucks. 
There's uh, a few other ones that are weren't really expensive cards neither. That but it's nice. Reprints. Like Mentor the Meek wasn't expensive, but I mean that's in so many white EDH decks that was nice to see. Gutter Snipe is always a good card in Limited. That was a good reprint to that see. That full art looks really nice yeah, for it us. Mm-hmm. That Reliquary Tower promo looks fantastic. That's getting a reprint. But that was creeping up close to ten dollars. Was it uh, really? Yeah. The the, the F and M promo one. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I regular, thought you were saying like regular the, one. I was the, like, no. what? But the regular one was still like three or four, I three. think. Yep. So that's nice reprint. Rex Sage is always useful. Magistrate, Magistrate Scepter. Scepter. That was super weird. Because that's Mercadia Masks, I yes. think, originally. Extra turns and standard. And it's pretty easy to put counters on it. Because it was at three counters and you can take an extra turn? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty easy to put counters on in a lot of EDH decks. I Actually, I wouldn't be surprised to start seeing that card. Because I think there are probably a lot of people that didn't even know it was a card that existed. Probably. And it was very good that they didn't know. Right. Like, I'm fine with that. <laughs> right, I'm totally fine with that. So I bet we'll start maybe seeing some of that show up in EDH as well. So those are the big reprints. Anything you guys wanted out of that list, like you were waiting for or looking for? Not really. I mean, it'd be nice to pick up a Crucible, another Crucible. but it, Yeah, I, yeah. Don't, I don't have one, so it'd be nice to have one, but I'm not. You don't need decks. Or, I, I think people m- might overestimate Crucible a little bit. It's not, it's not a great card, but like you need to have so many lands that go in your graveyard to care about it. And I think people maybe have seen someone else do really busted things with it, and they don't realize that maybe their deck doesn't allow that. Like You need to have, I, I don't know what the number would be, but maybe 10 lands that, that are going to wind up in your graveyard in some way, shape, or form. A couple of fetches, a couple, you know, crack, least, crack or lands. you need... Uh, or a graveyard centric deck where you're yeah. already where you're milling, milling yourself. stuff, right? But I think I think people just have seen it used against them against one of those decks and think they can just use it. I don't know if it works that way, um, but it needed a reprint. And I'm glad to see it. Yeah. So, the new cards. Let's talk first about the ones that kind of everyone is talking about. The six original Elder, oh, five original Elder Dragons, essentially six cards because one of them is a flip card. Oh, I. Th- Thought you were going to talk about all the co- cool horses. No, yeah. no. The uh, But we did get a cycle of six horses, which was weird. I don't even know what to comment on that <laughs> Neither about. Neither do I. Well, there's that horse there from is. our oh, devastation. Yeah. Why can't they be vehicles? Right, yeah. The Trojan right, horse. Right, yeah. <laughs> if, like, they made, 20. if they made them, like, colored vehicles, like uh, artifacts. And, and if they're crewed by... Such and such a legend, they get bonus or something like that. If the creature is a knight, it gets an additional plus one, plus one or something. Yeah. Yeah, that would be fun. So anyway, Elder Dragons. We got new versions, which are essentially younger versions of the original Elder Dragons before they got old and bad, apparently. based on what, how... What's the lore on this? I don't understand. So if you follow the storyline um, that's that they're like printing weekly right now, it's basically the birth of Bolas up through... When he, when, when him and Ugin first have their first falling out. Yep. So this, is, so over the course storyline, he's the dragons are all born, and these are them essentially during their first, you know, couple hundred years of life before they become actual elders. So these are the young versions of all the elder dragons. Okay. Um, I'm calling it now. Ugin is in one of the Ravnica sets. What, man, he's in this storyline a lot, and he didn't get a card, so it would not surprise me at all. Calling it now. Just going to throw it out there. Throw it down there? All right. Yeah, I, I could totally see that. Five-color Planeswalker. Um, all right. First one. Alphabetically. Let's just go alphabetical here. We don't need to spend a lot of time on because some of them aren't that interesting. I mean, <laughs> we have nothing new I to I think add. there's two of them that I'm even yeah. interested in. But the first one will let Max do because he's going to build this deck. I am. It is Arcades the Strategist. He is one and bant for a 3-5 legendary creature Elder Dragon with flying and vigilance. And then whenever a creature with Defender enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. And then each creature you control with Defender assigns combat damage as though with its toughness instead of its power and can attack as though it didn't have Defender. So, wall tribal, essentially, yes. is what you're going to build. Yeah. So, um, this, I think I I instantly dips this in our Eau Claire playgroup <laughs> chat in Slack. He literally did. He's like, <laughs> like, like within five minutes, you're like, I call dibs. <laughs> um, so back in episode 17, we did a Dex you play on a Doran the Siege Tower deck. And we have a couple of Doran decks in our local meta here. Yeah. And my biggest complaint when we did that episode was I actually took out all the stuff that removed Defender because I said they're too easily removed to there's make your right. entire plan fall apart. 
the thing I like about Arcades is you don't essentially have to build Defender, but you can. Right. It's just a much bigger bonus. Right. Yeah. And I, I did some research on Scryfall. There are 172 creatures with Defender in Bant compared to the 141 in Absam. Okay, so you're so you're looking at 30 more creatures. Granted, you don't probably get some of the support cards like you get in Abzan. But, I mean, I like playing green-white. I like playing blue-white. So Bant must just be in my wheelhouse, I think. And it's not Rafik. Right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Rafik, Rune, or Derevi. So. Well, there's a lot of cool stuff. We discussed this before we started recording, but talking about Wall of Blossoms and... The white one and I Wall of the, Omens. Wall of Omens. I forgot the name then, and I've now forgot it again. Uh, <laughs> but like that, but like because you draw a card off those two drops, and they have draw a card built in. Yep. Those are those are just zero four defenders that draw you two cards when you play them for two mana. I mean that's that's an amazing draw spell at source three speed two for two, and you've got a body swinging for four. I just thought of another card. I do believe Hornet's Nest. Hornet's Nest has is, defender. Yeah, it does have defender. <laughs> So now you've got someone your Death Touch guy that when they block it, it makes Death Touch Hornets. Yeah. He's like, you want to block? You want to block? Oh, I yeah. didn't think so. <laughs> yeah. the, the weakness of this deck is that it's really re- re- relying on Arcades being in play. Right. So you are going to have to dedicate quite a few resources to making sure people can't yep. kill him. Well, you do have other ways. You have like um, Assault Formation and stuff like that. Right, that, that's true. You know, to but, do it. But, but you're in banned colors too, so you've got a Cetacism, you've got um, Privilege position. position in addition to all the equipment. And, and all the... Pillow fort cards. Right, and the pillow fort cards on top of that. So so like I said, you don't have to go the defender route, but it you can if you want. Like that wall of omens on turn two isn't gonna do you any good if Arcades isn't right. out. So it kind of having needing Arcades out screws up your early game if you draw a handful of those two drop walls. But if you plan correctly And he's only a four drop, so he's pretty easy to to, to get, get out too. It's not like you're waiting until you until your seventh drop comes into play. Like he's at at, at four, that's pretty aggressive. Yep. I am very tempted to follow you in suit and build this for 1v1. Do it. Oh, just try it. Yeah, it'll be fun. you just sit there, drop all these low curve walls right. and just block for days, and then all of a sudden drop your general and just be like, brah, you're dead. And you have counter spells. You're in blue. You have counter spells yep. to keep yourself safe. Counter spells, ramp, and removal. Yeah. This mm. this is going to be... I, I really want to play oh, against this deck. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <like that. laughs> no, this is, the, this is the deck I most want to play against because I just want to see it. I think it's going to be fun. And it also, one of the things that Doran does that kind of always screws me up is Doran affects everybody. So like yep. if you've got a 2-3, it's suddenly swing for 3, and that can sometimes backfire. Because I've seen it backfire on Doran players before. Then it also messes you up. You're like, i got to constantly pay attention. This I don't have. This is easy. Like I don't need to do extra work and pay attention to my oh, stuff. I just have to look at your cards. Right, yeah. So, I mean, that's not like a big deal, but I like that. I appreciate being able to be lazy when I play. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do. Yeah, so... Like forgetting uh, Ulamog can't right, do what exactly, he does. Right, exactly, right. I think that works. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a judge. That works. We'll change those rules. I have well, a Sharpie. Yeah. Uh. All right, so there's also, like, we have Chromium the Mutable. We have um, Plady Moors. We have Victus Asmati. They're all various degrees of interesting. Um, but, like, I've got nothing to say that other shows haven't already said about any of those three. I'm not excited about any of those three, really. Are you guys? No. No. All right. I'm excited about the last one. Bolas. Let's talk Bolas. Nico Bolas. Nicky B, as they call him on the hood. What hood? Well, his hood. Like Dominaria. <laughs> oh, like I'm looking at his arm like, he's not wearing a hood. <laughs> Dominaria is his hood. He's the OG Or Amonkhet. Or Amonkhet. Or anywhere, really. He's <laughs> all over the multiverse. So He is the multiverse. This is, this is baby Nico you know, Bolas. It's Liliana. <laughs> um, he's also a four drop, like, like Arcadia Sabbath. So... Four mana for a 4-4 four, four dragon. That's pretty good. Chris, you want to read them to us here? Uh, so he's got flying. Uh, when he enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. Which oh, snap. Is, yep. So that's pretty... That's like If that's it, that's where his yep. tech stops. Four mana, 4-4 four, four that hits everyone's hand for one. That's which not, I like because for commander, it says each opponent. It's not right. just a target it's, player. It spreads around so it's good in center, yep. but it also scales in commander. Now for four colorless and Grixis, which is hint, hint, original casting <laughs> cost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, Exile Knuckle Bolas the Ravager and return to the battlefield. Transform under its owner's control. Activate this ability only any time you could activate a sorcery. So you can't do it in response to like a Swords of Polishers or something. You have to do it on your turn, but that's still pretty useful. Yep. And then you have Nicobolus the Arisen. 
Um, so he's got four lo- ability counters or loyalty things that he can do. Uh, starts with seven loyalty to begin with. So his plus two is just straight up draw two cards. Yep. So let's just put him to nine for plus two, net two cards. Sure, that seems awesome. That seems like a useful thing to have. So minus three. Uh, he deals ten damage to target creature or planeswalker. So let's just put him down to four and just blow something up. Minus four, put target creature or planeswalker card from your gra- from a graveyard. A graveyard. Not just Ooh, yours. I almost screwed that up. A graveyard. Onto the battlefield under your control. And there's minus 12 is exile all but the bottom card of target player's library. Oh, snap. Hope it's not a lab maniac. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Ouch. That's So the bonus planeswalkers have all been pretty good. And this one is also good. But it's one that you can play as your commander because he's a creature on the other side. I, just, I think the ability of plus two draw two cards, that's just, that's insane. Yeah, that's really strong. I, I'm a fan that if you put him in your Ur-Dragon deck um, and you maybe are running doubling season, you can alt him when you flip him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that quick. Chris is, no, <laughs> shame, shame. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, Bring it. <laughs> so are, are you going to build him, Chris? Do you have any interest in trying him for commander? I don't know about Commander. Um, I just want the card really bad. I need a few of them. And I'm going to tell all our listeners <laughs> why. There's a few of you who come down to D20. <laughs> I got permission from some other people, and the store owner's not too happy about it. But I want to get this card altered with our store owner riding on his back, Fabio-like with long hair blowing <laughs> in the wind. Nice. I, I would pay to. I'd chip <laughs> in for that altar. Yeah, no, I want to see that for sure. Fill a stride bolus. And then are you going to alter the planeswalker side so he's like in his hand or something? It's going to be where Nicobolus got like his arm over his shoulder or something like that. Hey guys, we're buddies. So, because Nicobolus is our LGS owner's favorite card by yes. far. So, I wonder if he'll build this deck. That wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me at yeah. all. Um, so, this guy, the creature's strong, the planeswalker's strong. I mean, you have to invest a good amount of mana to get him out. It's four mana to play in, then another seven mana to flip him, but you don't have to flip him. Like, there's no one's tell- saying you have to flip him unless it's absolutely useful. Casting him as a 4 4 body and then blinking him with Conjurer's Closet to do it again. Yeah, just rip cards out of people's hands. And- you're in blue, so you have a bunch of blue instant blink spells where, you know, you're spending one mana and a card and everyone else is losing a card. That's pretty good value for you if you're hitting three people with that discard ability. Um, I think just as a hand destruction general, he's really, really solid too. Yeah, I definitely think he will see play in standard. Well, standard decks, um, but for sure, like the Ur Dragon deck. Yeah, Ramos. Yeah, he's almost has to, or Ramos. Yeah, he's just too powerful not to. Yeah, yeah, I am a fan of this card. I'm not going to build him, but I am a fan. The other ones are interesting, and I just don't think they'll make particularly great commanders. I I I call them confusing more than interesting. Um, yeah, because no, of I, some no, of their abilities, that. like. Uh, Palladium Moors, he loses hexproof forever once he deals damage. Yep. Like that doesn't make sense to me, but whatever. I'm not on the design team. Yeah, and Victus Asmati has a cool ability. He basically chaos warps something whenever he, he attacks. But Every player it's has you as well. Yep. So I mean, you build a stack deck with him. You just build a, a sure. sacrifice deck, a Jund sack deck. But you're also going to get burned. Like chaos warp occasionally burns somebody when you cast one chaos warp on one thing. But yeah. you're doing it three times in a game, you're just you're gonna hit something that you're like, oh man, I really would like to have that propaganda gone. And I said to turn into an omniscience or something. Like at some point, that that's three times as many chances to have that go badly. And that's on every swing. Um and, and yes, you can tweak the top of your own library too, but uh, I just think there's a lot of pieces there to make this work really well. Chromium's weird too. He he becomes a one one with unblockable and hexproof if you discard a card, but then he's a one one. So he's. It's until end of turn, though. Yeah, that it is, is. In that my would... opinion, that is more of a standard based control card. Yeah. Kind of. Because he yeah. can't be countered. He has flying. You discard a card when he gets targeted and he flips into a 1 1. And has a, he has flash. Yeah. And you could build him as a kind of Voltron general. Then you can get. He's hexproof and unblockable at that point. So if you do that, then. And, you're, and he's got two swords on him or three swords. Well, you don't really care that he's a 1 1. The swords are doing a lot of the work for you or the. Batter Skull or the, you know, Graphite Exoskeleton or whatever you're running. Yep. Yeah. And he doesn't actually, like, exile or actually leave the field. He just right. kind of Becomes morphs. a 1-1, one, one. yeah. He powers down. He's probably, to me, I think, the most interesting of the remaining three. Yeah, I'd agree with that. All right. Let's move on since, I mean, you can just talk about this stuff forever. But we got five monocolor legends. There are various degrees of interesting. 
I think these are I think all five of these are better off in a deck than they are as a commander of your deck. Does anyone have any ones that they think stand out for them they want to go into? Not as specifically commanders, no. Like I think Psy is no, really, really yeah. good. Psy Masters Hopterist, he, he basically he makes a Thopter whenever you cast an artifact spell. That's really, really useful. Go into my Joyra deck. You're right. In, in, <laughs> in, in every Brea deck, because I'm probably running this and probably some Sharoom decks. And, Muzio, I mean, Arkham, yeah. Joyra, Memnite, so anything. If you're, if you're playing anything who's like an artifact-based commander who's blue, this is just great value. But all those generals are better as a general, so you're not going to replace them. No. Um, Isareth is kind of bad chainer. Like, if you're going to play Isareth, chainer is just going to do the same thing better. True. Now, have you thought about Isareth for Glissa? I might, I, I'm thinking about it because my curve is fairly low in that deck. So she's Death Touch. 3-3 three, three for 3 is pretty aggressive. I can bring back that Skull Winder. I can bring... And even if I have to pay 6 to bring back a Grave Titan, that's fine. I don't mind paying right. That's worth it. So I think I'll probably will run her in my Glissa I, deck. What I find interesting about Isareth is that you pay X to bring back something with a creature with CMC X from your graveyard, but it's an attack trigger. Right. But the creature you bring back isn't attacking. It so is not. Is that more of like a red mechanic you see? Red and white, I a think. A red yeah. and white or a red red something. Yep. Cause in, in this case, I kind of prefer it because like... You don't want to swing that, and have a that brand right. new Grave Titan right. into your... Yeah. So, it, no, in my deck where everything has Death Touch, sucks, if it came into play attacking, it probably wouldn't be very fun to block. But for most people, I think they would prefer maybe to have it not I, attacking. I just... I I find it odd. It's not like a combat damage trigger, if anything. Yeah. Because that seems more black. And that's what the black blue artifact guy out of the the partner one that brings an artifact yes. back on combat damage with death touch. Silas Wren. Yeah. There we go. Um. So his his is on damage, whereas this one is on attack. And again, I think she's a good card. And I just think if I was to build the deck, Chainer would be better, or maybe even Whisper, the new one out of Dominaria. Whisper. Hmm. It's yeah, kind of maybe. Same. It's kind of the same deal. At least Whisper like can flip Whisper the Whisper is a 2-2 two, two for 4. Right. Whereas and this with, is a 3-3 three, three for... I mean, on curve, this is a much better creature yeah. by far. Uh, Gorklaw. I like Gorklaw. <laughs> Gorklaw is pretty decent. I I think if you don't want to run Nylea or Omnath or Ronus, he might be up there for your mono green general. If you want to build mono green Stompy, being able to reduce, reduce the cost of all your big Stompy creatures by 2... Is all right, and is that he buffs them and gives them trample? Yeah, and I'm totally assuming that's ending up in Reki. That is absolutely <laughs> going in, that's absolutely going in my Reki deck. I will be drawing a card and casting Gorkla for sure. Uh, Lena, selfless champion, is the weakest of the bunch by yeah, far. We, we discussed this today with everybody in Slack because someone just asked me, "Is this going in Brago?" Man, six mana is a yeah. lot. Six so. mana for a three-three that. Well, uh, Lena, when she enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token for each non-token creature I control. So it's a conditional token maker. She also has the ability to sacrifice herself. Uh, creatures you control with power less than her power gain indestructible until end of turn. So that, that clause doesn't even need to be on there. Like if, if, if it was just sacrifice to make stuff indestructible, it still would not be that good. She still wouldn't be... Wouldn't be one of the better so, of these commanders. Why so. can't she be like a 5-5 five five or something like that? Yeah. Right. Or, or or be 4 mana. I just feel like she's overcosted. Yeah. She has that unnecessary creatures less than her claws. She's also a knight who makes soldiers, so she isn't perfect for a knight. <laughs> but like she's not perfect for a knight deck and she's not perfect for a soldier deck because so many of those like buff other knights buff other soldiers. Yep. So like you're splitting your focus then, which is never ideal. At this point, I'd rather just run Captain of the Watch. It's six mana for a three three. That makes three tokens no matter what. You're always getting your three tokens. Yep. You never have now sure there's some upside to Lena, but there's also downside yep. where she like might make you one. Like I, I think Lena goes in maybe like my Tajik deck where I could put like pumps red pump spells to make her bigger, then sacrifice her so all my, my two twos, my three threes are indestructible to like a blasphemous act or something. Selfless spirit is just better. Well yeah, and that's in that deck already. So And she kind of feels like a Boros soldier yeah. card just because she's overcosted and not that great. <laughs> but she kind of feels like that kind of like she would go in that deck. I right. Mean, I'm only partially kidding when I say that. So the Yeah, you're not kidding at I'm all. Kidding <laughs> at all. <laughs> so the last one we have is, is Lathless the Dragon Queen. Also for six, but she's a six six with flying. 
And she says, whenever another non-token dragon enters the battlefield under your control, create a 5-5 red dragon creature token. You can also spend one and a red to give all dragons you control plus one plus a zero until the end of turn. This is the card I said I bought cards for to make a deck. So I am making a mono red Lathless Dragon Queen deck. Chris is shaking his head. No. It's better than the Ur Dragon or Ramos. I prefer the Ur Dragon, I guess. Because, um, you know, as soon as Ur Dragon hits the field, you either kill it or you die. Right, yes. <laughs> so here, here's my thinking with Lathless and why I like Lathless. Part of the problem with, with playing mono red dragons um, is they all cost like six or seven mana. Yep. The good ones, for the most part. Um, in this case, I can run the bad dragons. This was kind of kind of my thought back when I was playing Edgar. But in Edgar's case, they don't not, nothing has evasion. Like all the one drop vampires are just one drop vampires, and it's pretty easy to get that board state wiped out. In this case, if I drop like a dragon whelp or a or a dragon a furnace whelp or something, there's a bunch of those that are like in the two or three drop slot. A dragon egg. Dragon egg. Slumbering dragon. Slumbering dragon is one mana. Any of those you play for like one, two, or three mana also makes you a five five. So suddenly you you can you can keep your curve really really low. The deck I've got is at like three point one eight or something. The way I've got it spec'd out right now, that's really low for a dragon tribal deck. It is. Everything has evasion on top of that, and they're making token bodies. I better see see a shivan dragon in there. I didn't put one in there, but I thought it was on the list at one point. <laughs> I wound up at the last minute being like, "Man, Stormbreath Dragon is just so good." So I put in Stormbreath instead. You need that. You need Thunder Maha Kite. You need Glory Bringer. I didn't run any of those because they're. Exp- I'm, I'm running like they're only all a five of mana. Re- That's not that bad. I have two five mana. They all dra- have haste too, I so they pay for themselves. Two five mana dragons. I've got Storm Breath and I've got Athbari Hall Kite. Are the two that are more than five plus besides Lathless. But between all the dragon, Thunder Maha, man, Thunder Maha. I have really to good. argue Thunder Maha's great. And maybe especially I when you're playing Flyers, Thunder Maha comes in, deals one damage on the Flyers, and then they all tap. Yep. So you I, come in I, and kill. And I might consider that one. Um. But I want to try it as it is right now. And then you have things like shared animosity. So when your creatures attack, they get plus one, plus zero for each other attacking creature. And uh, mana echoes, because it's on ETB. So when I make a dragon, I'm getting two mana refunded yep. right yep. away from mana echoes. Yeah, and then you can pay for those five drops. Then I play, I, maybe. <laughs> and maybe I'll find like... I, I th- you just want them to run Shivan Dragon. <laughs> but maybe I'll find like once I get playing and I can afford to have a few more big bodies in there. So anyway, I've already got the deck built online and i've ordered cards for it so once lathless comes out i will have that deck ready to go time to, for me to start playing whirlwind right exactly yeah <laughs> this will be the opposite of my recce deck where i've got all things in the air versus recce where they're all <laughs> on the ground <laughs> so anyway th- this is a good card i think it's going to be great in whether like if you're playing cal because i've seen calia dragon decks where it's calia and they're just running all dragons yeah. it's on etb it's not on cast so if you have this out and calia swings you're getting a token with the dragon that Kalia puts out. Yeah. Um, I think there's there's a lot of decks that want this in it as well. So um, I am a fan of Lathless. Is there anything else about those five worth talking about? I think I think we covered them. What's well, rock and roll? Planeswalkers. Five Planeswalkers, which is kind of old school corset style. Isn't it technically ten? Um, yeah, because there's like the... The intro the, the deck. Ba- the intro deck yep. versions. Um, Except for we'll, Bolas. So there's yeah, nine. There's ten points. So walkers, eleven. 11. Okay. <laughs> Bolus's flip. Yeah. So we won't discuss the intro deck ones because they're all pretty bad. Mm-hmm. How I about think the we'll Liliana one's probably the best one. Of the intro deck ones. Yeah. How about how about these five? What do you think of these five? Any ones that jump out at you out of these five that are worth going into in detail? That Tezzeret. Mm. So Tezzeret feels mm. disgusting in an artifact deck. Is that is that correct? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Another one I'm going to be hunting hard for. I mean, his zero just draws... If, if It's an artifact deck. You're just going to draw two cards every time in, like, Brea. Yeah. Or, or, or anything. Or any anything. EDH deck with blue, because you run Sol Ren, you run Lightning Greaves, you run Swift Foot Boots, boom, you're drawing two All cards. All your mana rocks. Yeah, right. I mean, even a non-artifact deck, he's probably accidentally just going to be a zero to draw two. Worst comes to worst, you start making Thopters and then draw two. Right. right. And he's five toughness, so he's, he can take a hit. You can well, alt him off of doubling season two. Yeah, <laughs> he's just really good value. Just throwing that out there for everybody. <laughs> the only one you can't is Sarkin. You know what? Okay. <laughs> I, I hope next time we play any of our listeners, I hope someone goes, hey, Max, guess what? Doubling season, alt these planeswalkers. <laughs> I'm be like, whoa, what's up? <laughs> we lived through that once in our life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's all Max's fault. 
Uh, okay, so Tezzeret um, is great in artifact decks, and I think he's just generally fairly decent. Can protect himself. He draws you cards. His ult is great. That's just gravy. How about a Johnny? Any thoughts on a Johnny? I I like the intro deck one better. This one isn't. He's he's. I'm gonna put him in my um mono dis- white. my mono white Dejero deck because he's better than the intro deck Gideon, which I have in there already. But he's not great. He's probably next in line to replace a card. Like the next time I should know where Elspeth's out. cloak is. Like the one art has him wearing it, the other art doesn't. And that awesome poster you can buy online has her wearing it. Right, yeah. In the underworld. What? Yeah, did you see the, the no, poster I didn't. for it? Uh, so there's a poster that they put out that has a bunch of Planeswalker arts, and, and uh, 95% of them are ones we've seen. But not all of them. One of them is an Elspeth, and she's dressed in like black. Black, she's holding Daxos's mask. Or probably her, or, or her mask. Or her mask. The gold mask from Theros when you're, yep. when you're undead. And she has, in the other hand, the the staff club thing that um, Xenagos had that so somebody she took from him when she killed him. So she no longer has a sword. She's got Xenagos' weapon instead. And she's holding the gold mask and she's dressed in like black. And there's some white. So she, she doesn't look evil, but she just looks pretty badass. I can't wait. And there was a new Ralzeric art in there, a new Garrick art. Which I'm assuming we're probably going to see these guys on Zendikar. Ralph, Eric, and I Garrick, would guess we'll probably. see. I guess we'll see Ralph for sure. I would guess we'll see in uh, or Ravnica. Not Ravnica, yeah. Um, Why is Zendikar on my mind? But yeah, there's a bunch of cool ones in there. Um, so anyway, if you haven't seen that poster art, check it out. Um, but yeah, his he his alt is pretty much the Sun Champion plus one. Yep, and you get it every turn. And I like the intro deck one. Read that one to. You. I, yep. I don't remember so. Ajani Wise Counselor is the intro deck Planeswalker for three and two white, five loyalty. Uh, his plus two, gain one life for each creature you control. And his minus three is creatures get plus two, plus two till end of turn. His minus nine is put X, one, one counters on target creature where X is your life total. Um, hmm. so Combine for, them with the other Ajani where you gain 100 life for yeah. result. Exactly. <laughs> or um, Hotly, the green, white hot, uh, Hotly gains you a loyalty. For each creature, for each you, creature control. you control, yeah. and yep. she does something else uh, with the amount of loyalty she has. Neither of them are amazing, I don't think. No. Uh, well, I don't really think there has been an amazing Ajani yet. No. I th- Maybe the green-white one at the best, the, the one from Theros or whatever. The or? Born of the Gods. I yep. think the M14 one, the one that Men- gives your loyalty. Mentor of Heroes is really useful. Yeah. In Ups a your super points, walkers. Yeah. yeah. Um. We'll go to Vivian Reed next because the other two I want to kind of cluster together. Um, Vivian Reed is pretty useful. Um, my complaint, and I mentioned this on the Idiot Direct podcast, is this could easily be a Nissa card or a Gura card based on the abilities, and I wouldn't have blinked if you told me this was the new Gura card. I'd been like, oh, well, all right, that makes sense. Because um, those are all three pretty useful abilities. Her um, plus one, let's look at the top five, excuse me, top four cards of your library, and you may. Reveal a creature or a land card from among them and put it into your hand. Ancient stirrings. So, so you're right. It's like an ancient stirrings. For minus three, destroys target artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying. So that's that's fairly useful. That's similar to Freylace as minus three. Um, and our minus eight, you get an emblem with creatures you control get plus two, plus two, and have a vigilance, trample, and indestructible. So that's pretty excellent too. And she's five loyalty, so she can alt, assuming no doubling season shenanigans. You know, and within four turns. <laughs> Assuming you're not max and like assuming doubling season. Just because doubling season got a reprint. Right. <laughs> I, not my fault. I have three copies of it now. <laughs> um, so she's just good. I mean, she's useful in almost any green deck. Um, but she's not something like Scream that I'm like, man, I have to run this. No. Whereas the next two are really, really specific. Liliana Untouched by Death and Sarkin Fireblood basically just say... Run me in a zombie deck and run me in a dragon deck. Uh, you can run Sarkin in a mono red deck just for his plus one ability. This card, card, draw a card. And yep. He's three mana. Three mana for that ability is pretty I, decent. I actually am probably going to slot him into Tajik just for that reason, just the, the plus one to draw and discard. Um, it's Boros. You need all the help you can get, and I and, guess Sarkin is going to try to help. And if no one kills Sarkin and you do that three or four or five times because you're keeping him protected, you're like, yeah, well, I can make four five five dragons for this ult at minus seven yep that's pretty good in any deck you don't need to have a dragon deck so i guess it's really only his, his other plus one because he has two plus one abilities which adds two mana um in any combination of colors but you can only use it to cast dragon spells 
So I'm actually going to put this in my Lathwa stack as well. And Liliana really likes zombies. Like the same Apparently, the yeah. Liliana, really into zombies is the name of the card. And I, which I find confusing. Like a few cards throughout this set I find confusing with their reprints for standard-wise. Like what is coming up that you need like scape shift and standard? Or is it just a proper time for them to reprint it? That's what I would guess. I'm going to guess it's just a proper time to reprint it. Same thing with um, Crucible. Yeah. Because like we had um, Excavator in standard, and I think that was their – like, well, Excavator wasn't broken in standard, so we can probably print Crucible and it's safe, whereas maybe it wouldn't be in some other standards. Who knows? Yeah, but now they print this Liliana, and really there aren't a whole lot of zombies around. We did get Death Baron as a reprint in the set. Um, I saw something online about this today where – like zombies are coming to standard again because there are two zombie lords there's the uncommon one from Ammon cat and we got death baron so there are two zombie lords and there's enough token generators and stuff along the way for three months yeah it was i'm gonna rotate this fall Mm -hmm. as soon as ravnica hits it rotates okay all the way up to ixalan everything from before ixalan rotates ravnica usually has some zombies but it's not like that heavy of a zombie set I, what I would guess with both of these two is they've hit this point with Planeswalkers where they have to be really, really careful because they tend to be really strong and standard, or at least really good value engines. And I think when they're if they make them really niche like these two, then they can make them strong, but they all they're also only strong in that certain deck. Okay, like you can't just jam this Liliana into an average deck, and you know Sarkin and EDH that. I guess the the looting is pretty good, but he's way better in a dragon deck than he is somewhere else. Yes. So I think with these two, I think we might be. I wonder if we're going to see more of this moving forward, where they design them specifically for one kind of niche deck. And that way, they can make them a little bit stronger, make them more efficiently costed, and not worry about breaking something else. Or they just try to stick to their their theme of sure, that yeah. planeswalker. That, yeah, they, well, they, they stick to the character. And it and helps not differentiate yeah. them too. Like if Liliana dealing with zombies, that, that's a Liliana card. You know what that is. And a mono black Soren card is going to be making vampires and right. doing lifelink shenanigans. So you can have more things. Like you can have them have an identity. So I'm fine with that. In M19, there are 11 zombie creatures uh, coming out in M19. Huh. So there is a bit of a zombie tub theme. I don't think it's good enough, though. In standard right now, and we're not going to talk post-rotation, there are 35. None of uh, them are good enough. Between, looks like, all f- everything but green. Should have been great back in... No, no, don't even suggest <laughs> it. <laughs> in Innistrad block? I remember playing against that zombie deck going, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah that would have been tough. All right, let's move on because we've got quite a bit more to cover here. I guess we're. Well, not I only we, have a few cards to cover. Yeah, after I guess. This. Yeah. I mean, let's let's go about specific cards and let's start with white. What in white is worth touching on? We're not gonna go over every card. Ooh, me, me, me. Chris, Chris has got his hand in the air, calling on you. Uh, a Johnny's influence. All right, read the card. So, uh, four mana, two colorless, two white for sorcery. Put two plus one plus one counters on target creature. That's cool and all. That's not what sure. I even care about. I care about the second ability. Look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a white card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest at the bottom of your library in a random order. So pretty much it is kind of a white card draw spell. Yeah. I mean, you get to go for other white cards. Plus you get the upside of putting counters on something. Mm-hmm. So I found that intriguing for the color of white. I wonder if we're not going to see maybe that if that might not be their solution to white drawing an EDH is to just staple replacement effects onto a thing where when yep. you cast this, you also get a card. Yeah. It's not like, it's because like they seem to like parody for white where you don't get ahead, but if they let you break even, whether it's like land tax or tithe or something, I wonder if we're not going to see more of this where like white will let you draw a card when you do it, but just one. Yeah. Right. Because that kind of makes sense in white and that's useful as well. Yeah, that's one of the biggest reasons I like it is because it's going to replace itself. Right. Yeah. Unless you hit all lands, then I'm terribly sorry that right, happened exactly. to you. <laughs> How about you, Max? You got um, any white cards you want to... I have two. All right. Uh, they're both angels. Uh, the first one being Sarah's Guardian. It's a 5-5 five, five for 6. Flying, Vigilance, and other creatures you control have Vigilance. Oh, let's combine that with... Uh, what's her face? Liar Dawnbringer. Yeah. And now yeah. they all have Lifelink, too? Oh. Yep. Oh, and then gosh. the other one being Resplendent Angel, who's a 3-3 three, three for 3. Uh, flying and beginning... Of each end step, if you gain five or more life, put a 4-4 flying creature token angel into play. 
And then you can pay six to give her plus two, plus two in lifelink, getting you to five. That might seem good in an Aloro deck. Yeah. <laughs> or a Dramoka deck. Or a Lyra Dawnbringer deck. That, that angel's just great. <laughs> and the first one, y- y- I looked at it the first time, and I'm like, ah, it's just like an intro deck level, like six mana angel, who cares? But I don't know, giving your angels all vigilance. No, it's your creature. Or your creature, it's sorry. It's all creatures. It's really thing. useful in a lot of yeah. decks. It's flying, it has a big body, it's got evasion. I mean, that's that's yeah. a pretty decent card. So I actually have their spots pretty much carved out in Dramoka for both of these cards, so I'm nice. ready to... Yeah, because you don't have a lot of Vigilance enablers, nope. and having your stuff not tap is pretty useful in that deck. Uh, Sarah's Guardian's going to take the place of Steel Hellkite. I said that I was going to put the Archon from Battle Bond in there, but I haven't pulled one yet, and this is probably overall better. Way better, in my opinion. Yeah. They're both six mana. I mean, it seems like it fits perfect. Yep. And then uh, Sarah's Guardian is just a... Not Sarah's Guardian, but the other one responding angel is just a nice three drop early game when that's usually a, i'm not doing much and that's a really aggressive price for that card that has that much upside i mean dromoka herself is going to net me that token every yeah. turn yep yeah no that's that that's a perfect card for that dromoka deck and i'm going to swords her at the end of the turn oh wait you can't <laughs> you can't do that <laughs> you save your mana you silly man i'm going to wear my nope t-shirt and only right. play dromoka yeah. <laughs> Um, the other one I will mention in white is Cleansing Nova, which is a card I just adore. Um, three and two for a not quite as good austere command, but a not quite as good austere command is still a pretty good board wipe because it says for those five mana, you can choose one, destroy all creatures or destroy all artifacts and enchantments. Um, which I like, man, I'm probably putting that in every white deck I have. Yeah. Or at least I'm going to be trying to find room for it because, that I, I, man, modular board wipes are so useful, I, and, and this is just one more. Five mana is nice too. I mean, I'd prefer it at four, but like they're not going to do that. I think this is like the perfect spot because yeah, at four you have Wrath of God and Day of Judgment. You axe Day of Judgment. You put this in at the five drop slot instead, and so at you, six you have lost your command. So you still have your aggressive four mana board wipe. You have this to to, to sp- sp- you know surgically remove that artifact player while you just lose one rock or something, and then you have Austria Command where you can even more surgically later on in the game really screw over somebody. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Cleansing Nova, and I'm going to... This is a card where I'm going to pick up, like, a handful of foils and just put them aside because in- at some point I'm going to want this in so many decks, and, and it's going to wind up drifting up to, like, 3 or 4 or $5. Indeed. So, all right, blue. Anything in blue you guys want to talk about? Nope. Uh, I'm totally nope. not a blue player. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of blue, Chris says nope. I have one, and it's really even not that great. What is it? Uh, one with the machine. I like that card. Uh, four mana to draw cards equal to the highest CMC of an artifacts you control. So in EDH, that's four mana to draw four off of Theron Dynamo. Yes. That's four mana to draw five off of a Gilded Lotus. That's four mana to draw six off your worm coil and four mana to draw nine off your dark steel forge and the next one would be probably blight steel colossus. Four an, mana to draw what? Twelve off of Draco. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> Draco, Draco. <laughs> but like if you're playing an artifact deck, well, I mean that's that's a four mana draw four off just Brea or yep. five mana off Shroom's five, I think, right? Yes, two and. Esper. Yeah, five. It's 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 four mana draw five off of Sent Triplets. I mean, there's a lot of artifact commanders where you're just going to be drawing four or five cards mm-hmm. for four mana and ha- with no downside. I, I would put this in a Ramos deck if you have Ramos. Oh, yeah. that's four yeah. mana to draw six, and you're putting a counter on Ramos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not going to run this in every deck because you need to have a decent sized artifact. But there are some decks where you just always have a big enough artifact in play. Mm-hmm. And it has that Rishkar's expertise feeling to it. So yes. if they take out that that blight steel, oh, I also have a Gilded Lotus or a Mirror Battle Sphere. And well, and if, it, and if, it, if it defaults down to your you know dark steel ingot or something, drawing three for four isn't terrible. No, like that's that's the if that's the down if that's the worst case scenario. That's a concentrate that's not bad. right there. Right, exactly. Yeah. Like the worst case scenario is a concentrate for the most part. That's pretty decent. Um. The one I wanted to touch on, because I like this kind of card, is Metamorphic Alteration, which is one in a blue. And it's an aura enchant creature. When it enters the battlefield, it chooses a creature. Enchanted creature is a copy of that creature. So number one, I like the you know Dark Stimulation, Lignify, Song of the Dryads kind of cards. This does that. But it, but it does it both ways. So like if someone has a 1-1 soldier token they made off of 
the runaway commander whose name I've already forgotten. <laughs> Lena. <laughs> Lena. Or, you know, a zero one saprling or even like a you know, some two two Eternal Witness, or, who cares? Or like an a, uh, 04 tree folk that's a Lignify. Right, right, yeah, exactly. That, that's already been turned into an 04 tree folk. You, so you can do the same thing essentially as like a Lignify does for two mana and use it off, use it like defensively to like take down a creature. But if there's something you want to remove and someone's got a, or you've got a Consecrated Sphinx in play, I'm just going to turn my other thing into a second Consecrated Sphinx. Or turn it into a second whatever disgusting creature you have in play. Turn so you can use it both ways. Like you can turn your weakest thing into the best thing in play, or you turn the best thing in play into the weakest thing in play. And both of those are both are really useful things to yes. have. Yeah. So, and it's two mana. That's pretty efficiently costed too. I like the versatility a lot. Um, I just put Deep Freeze into, I think I've got it in one of my decks. And I'll probably, I think this is better than Deep Freeze. I'll probably replace Deep Freeze with this. But I like the card. Um, I'll briefly mention Nexus of Fate. It's the buy a box promo, and it's a, a seven mana instant speed extra turn spell. But it, it's instant speed, and it does not exile itself. And it doesn't. It just goes to your graveyard. Uh, or no, actually, you shuffle it into your library. I don't believe that how, that's how it works. And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe it is a if it goes from anywhere aside from when you cast it and resolve it. So if it leaves from your deck or. Um, discarded from your hand because I do believe that's how all the Eldrazi read too is if it goes from your hand or from anywhere into the graveyard you shuffle it back in yeah so I don't think if you cast it and it resolves that that trigger goes off I do believe it has to be huh. forced out into your graveyard of some other way I said this would work like the like this, the, the, the Sun Zenith ones from from Fifth Dawn whatever that was because um, those get shuffled in upon resolution yeah hmm. that's the I'm only way Blue up. Sun gets we'll shuffled in okay if it would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, reveal Nexus of Fate shuffled into its owner's library instead. Yeah, because it says reveal, so that's why I'm curious about it. Wording. We will verify that. I will call my judge friends. Uh, anything in black that you guys want to talk about? I have the one. What's the one, Chris? It is our beautiful old zombie master Liliana and her contract. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. I have that That's on my cool list card. as well. Yep. Uh, three color list, two black for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you draw four cards and you lose four life. So five mana, you're just... Seems okay, I guess. Yeah. Um, the other stipulation, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control four or more demons with different names, you just auto-win. Yes. I kind of like that because it re- demons are not cheap to play to begin with. They're so, not. And they don't usually stick around on the board. So if you can pull that off, kudos to you. Worst case scenario, you're drawing four cards for five mana. It's Kali attack. Yep. Yeah. Or if you're like someone who's playing the Obnixilus Planeswalker deck and you're like, I'm playing Demon Tribal or something, it's just a like a free win condition in your deck. Yep. Where I had that Dragonlord Silumgar deck once upon a time that was running a bunch of like flyers and I would turn them into dragons with conspiracy, with conspiracy or, or whatever to Xenograph. Like, I would have jammed this in that deck just because in case I draw it and have a conspiracy, I'll just win the game because I'll turn myself all into demons. Yep. Now, it's this isn't going to go in every deck. Yep. Or and even I don't, many decks, but the decks is going to go when it's a pretty cool card. And I don't think I would be upset with someone playing this and losing to it because no, it takes sure a long not. time to set up, and it's not really, I don't consider this a combo win. There's certain conditions you have to meet to get there. I like the card. Going back to Nexus of Fate, um, comparing it to like the Blue Sun Zenith, Blue Sun Zenith is, says, uh, the rule says, if the spell does not resolve, none of its effects occur in particular it will go to the graveyard rather than the owner's library. Yep. Where I think Nexus of Fate is, no matter what, you, because upon resolution it goes to the graveyard, you reveal it, you shuffle it back in. Mm. I think that's how it's going to be ruled. Okay. That's why it's seven mana. <laughs> it's not much more than some of the other extra turn spells, so. Really, no. Because the, the new, um, the Karn one, Karn's it's Temporal, temporal Sundering, Sundering is, six? is six, I think, yeah. And at Sorcerer Fee, this is instant speed, so. The one other black card I want to briefly mention is Open the Graves. It's three and two black. Whenever a non-token creature you control dies, create a two-two black zombie. Um, this is good in a zombie deck, but if like my taste of deck where I'm constantly flopping stuff in and out of the graveyard, reassembling skeleton. Right. Oh wait, guess what? He's getting reprinted too. Yeah, another <laughs> reprint. Yeah. Um, this is just making me free stuff for doing things I was already doing, which is I'm, I'm always a fan of getting paid for. Getting paid extra money for the things I was already doing, that's great. And this is kind of doing that in that kind of deck. How about red? I have one. 
Nope. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm a red player too, and no. I didn't. None no. of these cards really stuck out at me for commander purposes. I mean, there's one, but everyone's already talked about it. So, is it Dark Dweller Oracle? No, it's Apex of Power. Oh, oh the ten mana yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, so mine would be Dark Dweller Oracle. It is a two mana two two creature uh, with the ability of pay a colorless, uh, sacrifice a creature. To outpost siege, essentially the cons mode. Right. You flip the top card, and you can cast it till the end of turn. Um, you may play it. So you, you may play it. it so you can do a land. land. Yep. yep. Um, I just like it because in Boros or Mono Red, those effects are nice. And in Mono Red, you're probably making tokens of some sort, so you have sack outlet, and you can sack itself to itself, where some other creatures like this are sack another creature. So I think it's just a it's a cool card, and it's that that impulse draw that we like to see in red. Yeah. Uh, green. Anything in green from anybody? Oh, I got green cards up the wazoo. Let's hear about them. Colossal Majesty. Three mana enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you control a creature with power four greater, draw a card. So that's ferocious. Oh, it's essentially kind of like ferocious. Yep. But it's just a three mana static enchantment, and you're playing green, and I'm almost going to guarantee you're going to have a four power creature out. Like winds up being almost a Phyrexian Arena in green. Yep. And then you pair that with the one that when when a creature with three power or greater enters the battlefield, draw a card, you're just set. And there's Triumph of Ferocity when if you control the creature with the greatest power, you draw a card. Yep. There's a few different variants on this in green. Um, And it's an uncommon. That's nice. I've got Runic Armasaur. Um, one and two green for a dinosaur. And whenever an opponent activates an ability of a creature or land that isn't a mana ability, you can draw a card. So I think that's pretty good, and I don't know, if, but I don't know if it's good enough to run generically in a deck. But if you're playing one of the dinosaur tribal decks... It goes. I think you absolutely run this, because it's just going to accidentally draw you two or three cards over the course of a couple turns whenever someone cracks that fetch land or you know taps a creature to do anything basically you get free card draw out of it right um i i have some notes on this too i think it's a really good late game because that's yeah. when you see the stuff like maze of it and all those utility lands kind of come into play and get used more often i think early game it's going to be hit or miss you know if you play in a meta where people don't play fetch lands or they play like the slow fetches you're gonna be kind of delayed on getting that getting your money back essentially off of this card um, but I also think in the late game, people are going to realize it and then get rid of it right away because. Now, what about this? What if it was instead of a two, five, well, it's also two, five. So then it kind yeah. of does. Goes into goes that in, dragon It goes deck. in my chromium <laughs> or, or Doran. Um, but if instead of being that, what if it was an enchantment for three or even two? So it just sat there as an enchantment, kind of much harder to remove and said the same thing. Now, how, now what do you think, think about that then at that point? I think that would be a little too powerful. I, I think, agree. I think it would be really, really strong then at that point. Because in green, enchantments are so, so much tougher to remove. And you're, I think you're just it's going to be the kind of thing that accidentally over the course of a game is going to draw you a ton of cards. I would love to see it as an enchantment. But as a dinosaur, it's probably pretty fair. Yeah, I agree. And so, I think a lot of people are just going to ignore it too at a sure. tier five. It should be in your, dino, in, in your dino tribal deck. It should be in there, I think. I think it will generate enough value to definitely pay for itself. So I have Elvish Clan Caller. It is a 1-1 elf druid for two green mana. And it says, other elf, elves you control get plus one, plus one. And then for six mana, tap, search your library for another copy of it, and put it onto the battlefield and shuffle your library. Could, that ability is going to do nothing for you in Commander. Well, in Commander. Yep. I'm not talking about Commander. Again, this is I'm talking more like Modern. Yeah, could this could be go another into, lord. into like a mono green elves deck? Because I know ideally you probably want to run green blacks. So you get shaman, but this is coco targetable. For modern, I don't think this is good enough. For standard, it definitely makes elves viable. Yeah, yeah. This single handedly probably makes elves a standard deck. Yep. Okay, that's all I had on it. I just got, was wondering about modern. What do you got, Chris? I have now. This one's a little overpriced. You're for overpriced. What it is. <laughs> Your mom's overpriced. Whoa. <laughs> What? <laughs> uh, it's called the Scala Wolf. Uh, it's a five mana, three, three. So three colors, two green. Uh, but when it ETBs, look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a green card from among them, put it into your hand, and then put the rest of the bottom of your, in random order. You really like these cards. I'm that liking you do, this yeah. mechanic because the whole thing that comes to my mind when I'm playing Commander is it's a hundred card deck. Yep. The more cards that I have that filter me faster through the deck for what I need to find, the better. Yep. So something like this lets you go, you know, 
five mana to look at five cards plus you get a body. I mean, it just it seems worth it. Oh, I totally agree. I yeah. actually have one later in the show we're going to discuss. Yeah. And it's a green card, so it's not a creature. So you could hit your Sylvan Library. You could hit your uh, Asceticism, any of that stuff. Yeah. All right. Is that it for green? I, that's all I had. How about gold cards? I have the one. What's your one? It is an Enchanter. <laughs> Not an enchantress, an, it is enchanter. an enchanter. Yes, <laughs> uh, Seder Enchanter, one colorless, uh, Selesnia. Uh Whenever you cast an enchantment spell, draw a card. Two two body, just your typical regular enchantress, but it's an enchanter. Yes, and I mean it's just like if you're playing Euro or you're playing cigar, like if your enchantress deck or your enchantment theme deck has white and green in it, this should be in there. This should just be in your deck, just full stop. I think. The hardest thing I think I'm going to have with putting this into Ural is what to take out. Sure. Yeah, the cuts get real yeah. at times, for sure. Yeah, this was, that was one of the gold ones that for sure jumped out at me. you have anything you've got here, Max? No. Uh, you know, my notes were pretty much excluding the Elder Dragons because that's where a lot of the gold cards went. Right. Um, they're all nice utility cards for some sort of purpose. You know, the Enchanter, you have the... the f- the vampire soldier that makes more soldiers. Yeah. Um, like, they're all really good utility, and they usually have some sort of creature tacked onto them so you can go tribal with them. But I just think they're 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 nice. They aren't anything special. They're not anything bad. So, they're just... They're the, cool uncommons that people will run. The gold draft cycle they always have is almost always fairly useful. And there's usually at least one of the cards that's EDH playable. I think it's the Enchantress this time, but there's almost always one of them that jumps out as a thing that should go in some kind of a deck. Um, Poison Tip Archer, I'm probably going to put in Glissa as well. I'm running... Um, really? Yeah. It's, it's, it's like the same thing as um, the 4-5 from Theros. Um, it's like almost the same abilities, but you're lacking the scry ability. The Reach is really useful. Is that what it is? Yeah. Just for the Reach? Like, I only have a couple flyers in that deck, one of which is Death Gaze Cockatrice, which is not very good. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, which is the same CMC. It's four mana for a two two with flying. Yeah, this has reach as well, and it has the the um, aristocrat kind of ability on yep. it. So I think I'm going to swap this, and it's like not anything amazing, but it's probably a slight upgrade over what I have. So I will probably make that move. But that is probably about it for the gold cards. Um, artifacts, anything special among artifacts? I have or lands. There's there's, there's one unique land as well. I have two. Artifacts I would like to talk about. The first being Chaos Wand. Yes. <laughs> uh, three mana for an artifact. Four, tap it. Target opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile an instant or sorcery card. You may cast that without paying the mana cost. Then put the exiled cards that weren't cast on the bottom in a random order. So this is cool. Like, it's, it's not a way to get kind of card draw, quote unquote, Card advantage, at least, in Boros. Right. Um, there is, like, a... I think we figured it out with some of the EDH rec guys. There's, like, a four-card combo, and if you know your opponent is running Nexus of Fate, you can infinitely take turns off of your opponent's deck. Nice. <laughs> I, I, I think, for the most part, too, like, when's the last time you saw someone with an instant or sorcery that wasn't worth casting? Sometimes their creatures are just, like, some goofy creature that, like, only works in their deck and you don't want it, but they're... The instant sorceries in most decks are always going to be either a usable removal spell or like a draw spell or something. So anything you get I, off this is probably going to be helpful. I also like it because, I mean, in, in Vegas we saw a lot more tops than we're used to seeing here back at home. Yeah. This is awesome top uh, disruption. Yeah. So either you can sack the top to draw that card you want or and then get rid of it because I'm going to throw it on the bottom of your library somewhere or you decide you just need to not have that top card right um my second one is along the lines of the card as chris has been talking about all episode it's tetherit's gate breaker uh four mana for an artifact when it enters the battlefield look at the top five cards of your library you may reveal a blue or an artifact card from among them and put it into your hand put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order it also has the ability five and a blue tap sack it Creatures you control can't be blocked this turn. So along the lines of what Chris has pretty much said for the other two cards he talked about, I'm going to put this in Brago strictly to filter through my deck because if it's going to get rid of five lands that I don't even want, 
awesome. Yep. And worst case scenario, you hit a blue card that you really need. Or right. an artifact. Yeah. It hits my mana rock that I'm in need of, or it gets me a, a blue-white creature, or... And you can blink and redo it. All the time. That deck is really useful. So and, yep. you know, Brago's biggest problem is getting damage through. Having a second Rogue's Passage in the deck is nice. True. Yeah. Um, I want to mention Dragon Horde briefly. Um, three mana. And you can tap it at one mana of any color to your mana pool. So, worst case, it's a mana lift right there. You're not supposed to Don't run mana lift. Mana lift. Mm, and it's in the set. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had it in my it's notes. In the set, that it says, is. to talk about mana lift yeah. and troll Dana, is, that's one of the cards I'm choosing. Well, I just self trolled myself. <laughs> um, but it also says whenever a dragon enters the battlefield under your control, you can put a gold counter on Dragon's Horde, and you can remove a gold counter and tap it to draw a card. So it's, I mean, worst case, it's a three mana mana rock. But if you're playing dragons, mono red dragons, mono like like a mono red <laughs> dragon deck that I'm building, this would be a pretty good mana rock for you. But even maybe if you just have like a Dramoka, even like I don't know if you want to run in Dramoka necessarily, but you're running Commander Sphere in that deck already, I think, right? Yeah. So I mean, this essentially, if you cast Dramoka one time, you can tap it to draw your card without having to sacrifice the the rock. I don't know if I necessarily like say it's better or replace it, but um, with me pulling, planning to pull Steel Hellkite, it is not as good because it's down now. I'm down to two dragons. Sure, the two Dramokas. But still, I I I think it might be worth considering in that deck. Maybe I, the the fact is with Commander Sphere, I can. You can always do it, and I and can, you can do it after tapping it too. Right. Along with the fact that I run enough graveyard recursion where I just get it back. Bring it back, sure. Yeah, Commander Sphere, the, the, the real unsung hero part of Commander Sphere is being able to tap it for mana, then sacrifice it. That's the super useful part. Yeah. So this I would run in last list. Number one, it's mono red, so it's going to also be even more useful as a card draw. And it's there. mono dragons. And it's mono dragons, so like, it's it's even yeah doubly so. And it's ETB, it's not yes. some cast. So last list tokens are yep. going to trigger it. So yep. Every time I play against an Ur Dragon deck... And they play a Manolith or something. I can be like, there is a better right. card. There's a way better card for you. Uh, I also like Desecrated Tomb, which is three mana. And it just that was one. the one that is I it? was thinking of. And I like I, that it leaves, leaves your graveyard. That's really cool. So whenever oh. one or more creature cards leave your graveyard, create a 1-1 one, one black bat creature token with flying. What? What happens when I uh, reanimate with a lush? Oh, I get bats too? Get this is going to be awesome. Three flying <laughs> bats. That's fantastic. I, I love the art on this card too with the yeah. bats like flying out of the tomb yep. and everything. I feel like there's a couple cards that have weird bat abilities in here, and I feel like they were probably leftovers from Ixalan because they mentioned the bat god a few times, but it was never came up in the storyline. And I feel like when probably once upon a time that was supposed to be like a three block set when they were going to do that. Okay. I wonder if the bat god wasn't a larger part of the story that they pulled out, and they've just put a couple of these cards in the core set because I feel it because it just feels like that environment. So the fact that there's multiple bat cards, we haven't had bats forever, seems strange. But it's a cool card. I like it. Um, same as like with your Lesha deck, with my Tasa deck, where I'm bouncing stuff back. It's also value for doing the thing I was already doing. Yep. And my Lesha deck is based around tokens, too, yeah, creating right. tokens. So, so that just helps. more tokens then. Yep. Uh, anything else for artifacts? Mm. Nope. Not any good cards. I love some art on these, but that's yeah. about it. What do you think of the detection tower? I think it's not great. <sighs> Until one tap until end of turn, your opponents and creatures your opponents control with hexproof. Lose hexproof. Lose hexproof, essentially. I mean, it's a, it's a variant on Arcane Lighthouse, and I don't already don't see very many Arcane Lighthouses. Doesn't Arcane Lighthouse remove Shroud, though, too? It yes. does. Also, the that's, Shroud. That's the big thing, is that this card is printed now in an era where Shroud is no longer right. a thing. But in Commander, Shroud is still huge Lightning sometimes. Lightning Grease alone makes Shroud a yes. thing. But this also removes it off a person. But you don't see hexproof on a person that much. I feel like this is the card you, you you run this if like one of your friends that you play with every week has a new Sigarda deck where Sigarda gives them hexproof or like a new Shiley yep. deck. Narset. Or like a Narset. Or like, like if you play again in a meta where you always see this one hexproof creature, then you might want a second Arcane Lighthouse. That makes it, sense. But it, but why wouldn't you just run Glaring Spotlight? I mean, I know it's not a land, so it takes a, it technically takes a spot. But glaring spotlight also is let's alpha strike, right? You can also sack it to do that alpha, that alpha strike yes. for a win. If give you, you want hexproof, to. give your guys hexproof and unblockable for three mana. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting, um, 
but I'm already just not that into Arcane Lighthouse, so just not, I'm not sure a, a variant on it is something I care about. But it's there, and maybe it'll be better than I think. I like the fact that it's Mirrodin art. You can see that it's taking place on Mirrodin. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Hint, hint. I wonder if that's where I we're going. I feel like that may be a thing. Because one of the um, the Tezzeret cards uh, has a flavor text with him talking about how the planar portal is now part of his machinery. So he's uh, absorbed the planar portal into his body, and he can now transfer form things across planes through himself. And he was interesting. And, and he made some deal with the Praetors before he left Mirrodin. Now it doesn't mean he's gonna they're gonna like follow through in that storyline or something, but like I could see that being a thing. Give me a four man Alish Norn. The third Ravnica oh, set. The third Ravnica set is them pouring Frexians Frexians in through the planar gate into Ravnica. I just see and him Jace like puking them up. Right, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that'll happen, but like I that would be I mean the pieces are there to do that. So, all right. Uh, so, what are your final thoughts about this core set? I am disappointed because it's missing one thing. That Sliv- every core slivers. Set, well, no, not that. <laughs> that's that's a whole other story there. But every core set, as far back as I can remember, always has a cycle of rare lands. Oh yeah, yeah. And there isn't this any has here. one rare land in the whole set. Yeah. I was really hoping we were going to see allied pain lands. Yes, I would love sure. that because I don't think it would hurt standard. Um, they need a reprint. They haven't seen a reprint in quite a long time. Or the other other half of a cycle, the other half of the cycling lands, or the other half of the battle lands, or something would have been nice. Yeah, I mean something that is unique to Corset, because usually like Corset gives like the pain lands or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's so. a good chance to print them. Like, I wish they'd have done that as well. I agree with that. How about you, Max? What do you think? It, you know, it's cool to have a Corset back, but I think this one specifically didn't bring a lot for EDH. Where, you know, we just got off of Dominaria, we got off of Battle Bond, Ixalan, all these sets had a lot of EDH yeah. all-stars in them, and I haven't quite seen that card yet that says, yes, that's always going to, we're going to see that forever now. I, I think that if you compare this to, like, Dominaria or something like that, you know, it doesn't, like, if this was the Ravnica set... I'd be probably kind of bummed out. I would be crying. And I wonder but, if that's why this is so But it's a core set, though. Like, like, compare it to M15 or M14 or M13 or M12. We didn't no get, slivers. We didn't get Jace memory adapt, so I guess I'm happy. Right. Yeah, I mean, like this, for a core set, I'm pretty happy with this. Like, yeah. if, if every core set moving forward gives us five cool, like, old creatures, like Elder Dragons, and we get five new Planeswalkers, and we get Scape Shift level reprints... That's pretty good for a, for a core set. Like maybe not what I want from standards from like a, you know, standard kind of set, but um by comparison, M14 and M15 were pretty trash. And Agreed. this is this looks way better. So they've kind of figured out core sets, I think. Yeah. For a core set, that's the caveat here. Um but I think there's some fun stuff here and I'm building Lathless. So, <laughs> and you're building one too. Like we've got We've, we're, we're both building a deck out of this set. That's not nothing. True. So, all right. That, I think, is it for Core 2019. Until next week, I am Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris.